Uh, I'm going to move swiftly along to our next speaker, who is uh, Martin Khosla. Martin leads, uh, is the lead designer for RKDS ar uh, Architects, but he is also an artist. Uh, and it's interesting when an architect turns artist, because uh, so much of architecture is about looking at uh, buildings as objects. And uh, Martin's work as an artist sometimes kind of goes beyond looking at um, the object uh, and perhaps expands our field of view. So without further ado, may I welcome Martin on stage. Thank you very much. So I'm going to attempt to speak about photography in architecture. So as a result, I'm going to read. Uh, when we're speaking about our projects, I can talk without any, any pieces of paper for a long time. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, so there's been a dramatic shift over the years in the experience of architecture. With digital photography, the image is instant, and with the internet, its dissemination is wide and equally immediate. This manner of the immediate image has greatly increased the speed of interacting with the architecture. I would venture to say that there's almost a consumption of architecture. Programmatically varied buildings, detailed materiality, and complex urban settings have all begun to be consumed within exceptionally short durations of time. This pattern of the fast relationship to the image is not peculiar to architecture, but I think it begins to present a peculiar uh, problem for the deeper understanding of architecture. There's more than ever before a prescriptive and formulaic composition of the image that has developed of architectural representation. Now this image increasingly lends itself to the speed at which it is consumed. So the image and its consumption become a self-perpetuating reality. Compositions of buildings with the entire urban or even the immediate context cropped. Uh, the images are at dusk with lights on against a darkening sky. The day shot with a solitary blurred figure uh, moving in the background or a barren room with a singular chair. Uh, and su such images while representing one possible reality cannot claim the power of holding or representing architecture. And facing the onslaught of prescriptive compositions, we almost forget the incredible ability of photography to be able to present several realities. The story of the blind men describing an ele elephant comes to mind. We forget to see architecture as narrative, and we forget to see it materially and temporarily age over time. We capture the building in its pristine, brand new, gift wrap state. We forget its life cycles, and we miss attempting to capture its relationships with light and time. So today in my talk, I'm going to confess to being a victim of this. So I would like to take you through my journey of recognizing the narrowness of architectural photography and opportunities for us as architects and photographers uh, to represent the multiple realities of architecture and its lived experience. Uh, so I'm gonna try and very quickly share four projects that are based in Delhi, completely different ones. One is an institutional building, one is a corporate building, uh, one is a public building, and one is a private house. Uh, and I'm just going to critique my own self as I do this, uh, but also share some images that one would not normally uh, share with you. So um, this is the dental college that was built for the Jamia University. Uh, this is an image that definitely went out for publication. Um, it's in plan, it's a simple uh, building. It's on a no north-south axis uh, with uh, two courtyards in the middle. Uh, all the classrooms are, are lit from the north to be able to bring in as much natural light. And it's, uh, it's a teaching institution, which is also a, a hospital which, ha which services uh, people from, from the neighborhood. Uh, it's built on the edge of, a, of, a, of the university campus, and it abuts a very densely populated uh, residential area. So this, this is an image of one of the internal courtyards looking at a fully glazed north facade. Uh, where, the, where the teaching classrooms are behind. And this is uh, looking at, at the other um, courtyard from the central main connector. And a detail of the south facade. Now, I'm, I'm trying not to basically dwell on the architectural aspects of this as I would uh, normally. Here's, here's the building as it gets presented in a, in a publication. This is the building when I zoom out a little bit. So this is the southwestern uh, facade of the building. Uh, I've stepped back. I get a little closer. 
This is the northern side of the building. So this is the, the glazed end of it uh, on the north side uh, as seen from, uh, from, the, from the residential housing. That's the urban context. And as I zoom into to a, a glazing detail, you start to see the city behind it. I'm gonna quickly move on to uh, the corporate uh, office that we've made. This is the headquarters for the Volvo uh, iShare Group, uh, as well as uh, the Delhi offices for the Royal Enfield Motorbikes. Uh, this was a st uh, dry construction, completely steel building. It was meant to be a very highly engineered building. Um, it's a lead platinum rated building. Um, um, and it was quite, quite unique for, for, for when it was made. This was completed about five or six years ago. So this is a typical floor plan of it. I'm just sharing the plan just to give you a sense of like what, what we're talking about, but this is not what I want to dwell upon. So this is a uh, column-free workspace in areas and, and two circulation cores and uh, running down the center of it. That's the main building. Now these are all publication images I'm trying to just share with you. That's um, on the cover of steel structures and metal buildings. But this is the context within which this building sits. Um, I've stepped out a bit. This is the, um, this is the eastern facade of the building. Um, and this is the, the northern facade of the building. So here it sits here. So. Um, I'll just carry on. So we also live in an age where in India we already have a crisis of there being a complete lack of architectural discourse and an equal absence of conversation surrounding urbanism in our broadsheets and main, mainstream media. The little that does exist reinforces the idea of buildings as singular objects. This has led to a reduced and a, a much smaller understanding of architecture and an equally problematic aspiration for architecture, which is now abundantly visible more and more in our urbanscapes. And in particular, in cities in India, where the informal not only consists of the majority of the city fabric, but where the formal and the informal, or the illegal, coexist in a dynamic equilibrium, reducing the understanding of the city to a sum of its parts in the form of only built objects has become very dangerous for our very own existence, and per perhaps without us realizing it. I mean, we have to understand that 93% of our workforce of the country is informal. Um, 68% of Delhi is illegal or semi-legal in some form or the other. So I, I think I'm, I'm talking about the, the larger sort of urban context. Um, so I want to illustrate this very attitude towards the city through an experience I had with a building that I'm very close to, which was completed about five years ago. We were approached by a public charitable trust to build a primary healthcare center uh, for the poor in old Delhi. The building site was on the edge of a railway storage yard, uh, let me just see. So that was the site, it was right next to a uh, railway storage yard, the cargo shed, and it was, at the base of it, there was a, the hutment of uh, 40, there was a 40 hutman sort of illegal slum at the base of it, there's a public library, uh, one of the major hardware markets of Delhi by day and, and one of the most sort of uh, recognized uh, red light districts by night, so it's GB Road. Um, so the work of a manual laborer in this area is hard and the pay is so little that the nourishment levels are very low and drug usage is very, very high here. So as a result of this and other factors, the prevalence of tuberculosis and HIV is very high here. So the health facility was meant to be a port of first call for the poor who are of living in this area. And there were some very interesting debates within, uh, within our studio about the urban intervention that we were going to do here uh, and what the form of the building that would take. So this is, this is an image uh, of, of the site uh, during construction. So along the railway lines, you can see the informal, uh, uh, the slum cluster that's there. And that's looking at it from the railway lines. So there's, there's, a, there's a mosque you can see on the bottom left image. So the site is immediately to the, to the right of that. Um, this, this was um, the building that, that we, we built. And there was this whole idea of actually trying to insert a very contemporary, a bold building within, within this space. But um, 
I, 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 I want to sort of refrain from uh, having this conversation about the ar architecture of it uh, right now. So I'm just going to go back an image. So I want to speak about our attitudes towards the city, which I think are often significantly informed by our imaging of our architecture. Now, this building was to be inaugurated by a politician. However, three weeks prior to the event, the entire slum cluster at the base of the building was demolished. Now, this is for the people who we were building this building for, you know. So, you know, here was real life um, imitating architectural photography in a sense, you know. So my own personal interest in urbanism is informed primarily by the idea of the urban context and its socioeconomic politics. While I have recorded images and the idea of zooming out of the prescribed frame to document my buildings, I've shared with you today, I've personally often felt helpless in exploring the larger questions of the city through my own practice. I've found this space through my art practice and perhaps going forward through an attempt to re-image some of our projects. However, in an image-driven society where the academic nuances of architecture and the city may not be followed, photographing architecture differently would perhaps liberate buildings from an image of themselves. And for this wider understanding of architecture, there are several trajectories that need to be imagined and discussed. There probably is a need for people not related to architecture to explore ways of imaging it as well. One needs to capture the several complexities of architecture. And two minutes? Are you kidding me? <laughs> several complexities of architecture and urbanism in the built, fo built form, the light, the volumes, materiality, weathering, adaptability, alterations, how you know, users alter buildings, political and social aspects of the site and the city. And all this would make for a richer understanding of architecture. What is of some concern is the role the architect has begun to play in the relationship between the image and the building. We have begun to play a pivotal role in the projection of this nature of image to a wider audience. Consciously or subconsciously, we encourage these images to be taken and as we select these images that continue to look at our buildings as singular objects when we send them for publication. Instead, the moment of capturing of the, of the building needs to be stretched. We need to slow down a great deal to look at architecture. The lens to capture it needs to be widened to include the urban fabric which forms the context and the reference to the building and equally importantly, the angle of view needs to zoom in to capture the interaction of light and material and narrative of the space. So how does one apply this? The ideal time most of us architects believe to capture a building is a brief moment after its completion and prior to the occupants moving in. Probably the shortest of moments, the least representative of moments, and one where the render matches the reality the closest. So the most improbable of moments. I mean, it's a bit like sort of, you know, how we present our buildings is like spring, summer 2018 collection or, you know, it's, it's not sort of, we have much longer lives and we have, buildings have longer lives and we have to sort of revisit them and rethink about how we do this. So I'm going to take this improbable moment as a, as a starting point for me to attempt to recalibrate images of a recently completed project. This has required sort of the cooperation of a willing client who's allowed us to, to go back and, and um, um, revisit a building and take photographs of it sort of in different ways over time. So I'm running short on time, but uh, I just quickly want to share this, this project which was just photographed just a few weeks back. It's a house on a very tapering uh, site that narrows from 20 meters down to five meters. Um, it has three components. Um, there's, a service, there's a service tower, there's a brick sort of uh, block where the living spaces is and a stone front area, which is the narrowest of part of the building where the, which are the social spaces, the, the living spaces, the family rooms, etc. cetera. Um, that's, uh, that's, a, that's an elevation of the building and that's the section. And to compensate for how narrow the site gets, the section basically starts to open up, creating double heights in the public spaces. Um, but I'm going to rush through. That's, that's, that's a project. Uh, to, the, to the right, you can see the service tower, which holes in it, the generator, the water tanks, uh, staff quarters. The, the brick building uh, at the back is where all the bedrooms are and the st stone um, tower in the front is, is all the public spaces. So the living spaces of the brick tower has a very rigid geometry to it, which is informed very much from the outside. 
Uh, the public spaces has, has the fenestrations are such that they're designed from the inside, looking at sight lines on the outside. So that's the, that's the narrowest part of the building. There are two double height spaces in the front, a living room and a family room. And it opens up in, in various aspects. Those are the three volumes as they step back. That's the building looking at it from the, from the rear. That's a service tower. And that's, um, that's the living spaces on the inside, seen as seen from the, from the upper space with the furniture uh, installed in place. And I couldn't help but have an image of a solitary chair in <laughs> uh, to share with you. Uh, so living space. I'm sorry, I'm rushing through this. I would perhaps at a later stage speak about this a little. So as you just saw, the building's been photographed a few weeks ago in a normal way. But as a first step, a dear friend and an incredible photographer has uh, gracious enough to spend a day there uh, building, photographing it from points of views that I could never possibly imagine. And I'm going at the end of this month, armed with a new and terribly expensive camera to, to, to photograph uh, architectural details, something which I've always wanted to do, but limited, always limited its communication to, to detailed drawing. So that's something I'm going to attempt to do. So I hope that in, this may culminate in a few years in an interesting and in-depth re Im imaging and a reimagining of this building, and I hope I get a chance to sort of share it with you after a while. But thank you very much. <laughs>